There we go. <clears throat> Why do you worry about clothes? Consider how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory was adorned like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grasses of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? Or you of little faith? Therefore don't worry, asking what will we eat, what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the Gentiles strive after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. So be it. Good morning. So my first question is, how many of you guys can sing? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, I do thank you and praise you that we can come and seek you and that you will be found by us. We thank you, Lord, that you love us unconditionally, even though we continue to be a stiff-necked people. That you would give your son to die for us is just beyond what I can fathom. Lord, help us to seek your kingdom today, to seek King Jesus, to be a righteous, holy people that serve you and honor you and bring glory to you because you deserve all of our praise, glory, and honor, and so much more. Lord, open up our hearts and minds to hear your word and apply them to our lives today. And we just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I don't mind that noise. That's beautiful. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of tired. So. If, I stumble on my words or anything. You know, we said, you want us to keep the kids sometime? Sure. I'll bring them tomorrow. Then it was, I'll be there tonight. Then it was like, I'll pick them up Tuesday. I'll pick them up a week from Tuesday. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Today is day 22. Day 22 that Jesus gave convincing proofs that he was alive and that the kingdom of heaven had come. You know, I, I sit there and think about that. All of the hope that Jesus Christ was the one, all of the mighty miracles, but then the crowds turn and the Pharisees and the, and the people crucified their king, their Messiah. So he just couldn't be the one, right? All of our hope was in Jesus Christ. But then some ladies went to the tomb that morning and came back with this story that the tomb was empty. And then we have that appearing to those on the road to Damascus and how Jesus opened up the scriptures and their hearts burned. And now Jesus is here on earth, day 22, if we take ourselves back that time. They don't know how long he's going to be here. It's not uh, implied from scripture at all that. In fact, the disciples ask him when he ascends or is now the time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel. But they were hanging on every word that he had to say. Because here is the person that showed all these convincing proofs, that, that fulfilled all the prophecy, but the biggest thing was now alive, who once was dead. The hope that I can put my faith into King Jesus just puts away any other doubts or fears. Why should we ever worry or doubt? Why shouldn't we seek the kingdom of God first? And then to know that if God loves me that much that He would do this from, from the beginning of time as I can fathom it just makes me want to serve King Jesus and His kingdom that much more. So we're at day 22, and I want to remind you of day one on your reading, which said, After his suffering, he showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them for a period of over 40 days, speaking about God's kingdom. And last week I told you that people in that day and people throughout the past, but we don't recognize it quite as much, but they're very familiar with kings and kingdoms, the powers of this world, the kingdoms of this world. And your responsibility as a subject 
to that king and that kingdom. In Matthew 4, 17, Matthew says that from the time that Jesus began to preach, He began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From the time He began to preach to the time He was crucified, and then we know that after this, because it says He spoke to them for 40 more days about the kingdom of God. The kingdom is, is spoken of over and over and over in the New Testament. 162 times is the Greek word basilia used in the New Testament. And many, many of those times is by Jesus, speaking about how we are to respond, how we are to live as subject to that king and that kingdom, and that you will serve one king in one kingdom, or you'll serve another king in another kingdom. A kingdom means royal power, rule, authority, dominion, triumph, because there has to be victory to establish that kingdom, something that was conquered a certain territory, dignity, and then don't forget that you have a responsibility as an occupant, as a servant of that kingdom. Every king has one ruler, one king, one authority. And in this case, it is Jesus. You know, Jesus mentions a kingdom over and over and over again, but ironically, and you understand this more, but people who don't know King Jesus, don't understand it as much, but Jesus never called Himself King. Now the Bible refers to Jesus as King all the time. Jesus does have a conversation with Pilate and it's brought up, but Jesus never referred to Himself as King because it's a given again that you understand that. That God created all things. That you are subject to His rule and His authority. You are a part of His kingdom. And Jesus is king. He rules over everything, including death. So the question is, is Jesus your king? And if he is, then is he reigning? Because you should understand that in that relationship. How are you living your life to show that King Jesus is alive and the kingdom of God is at hand and will reign eternally? The conversation with Pilate reads this way in John 18, verse 36 to 38. This is Jesus' response to Pilate asking him if he is a king. Jesus answered and said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is not of this realm. Then you are a king, Pilate said. You say that I am a king. Jesus answered, For this reason I was born and have come into the world and testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate responded by saying, What is truth? But see, you know the truth. You know that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You know that the Word was with God in the beginning, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know that Jesus Christ laid down His life to save your life. That His sacrifice paid the penalty for your sins. It was accepted by God. And if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you will have eternal life. If you believe this, is Jesus reigning as King of your life? King Jesus is alive. So since you know the truth, I've got a little definition here for you. You may like this definition, you may not. But it's my definition to remind me of kingdom. I know that it's God's kingdom. It's understood again. It's God's reign through God's people over all that is God's creation. You have been left behind and Jesus stayed behind 40 days teaching us about the kingdom, that He was alive, that He reigns. Even though we can't see the kingdom physically in this world, we are actively ushering the kingdom into this world, and the kingdom is at hand now because Jesus has conquered death. He has paid the, the penalty for our sins. He is reigning. Is He reigning in your heart? And are you living for Him, ushering the kingdom into the physical presence of this earth? You once were blind, but now you see. You once were sick, wretched, pitiful, blind, but Jesus saved you. He rescued you. 
if you put your faith and trust in Him. So why do you think Jesus stayed around 40 more days? Because He wanted us to know that even when He was gone, that He was alive and that the kingdom of God is at hand. So we have to know how to respond to that. I'm going to take us back to Genesis 1 to remind us about the beginning again. And I'm reading from the NLT in New Living Translation. Genesis 1 in the New Living Translation, verse 26, says, God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign. That's why I chose the NLT. Your version may say rule or have dominion. Those things mean the same thing. But we were put on this creation of God's for our enjoyment, for everything else, but to reign over it, to be responsible. And we have a responsibility even more because we know of God's love and what Jesus Christ has done for us to not only reign and be responsible of the things on this planet, but be responsible for the kingdom, for men, to be fishers of men, to teach them about God, to be thankful, to live our lives for God. Not our kingdom come, but God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. While the earth, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the skies, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given you every green plant as food for all the wild, an for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked all over all He had made, and He saw that it was good. God's kingdom from the beginning God created he is sovereign but he gave us a place to rule and reign over it to be responsible for the kingdom that is his Jesus talks about that quite often in his parables where he says a king is going away and then left his servants in control of what he had you are responsible for the kingdom of God and for being a fisher of men in this world Kings have kingdoms, and they have subjects and servants. Who is your king? If it's King Jesus, if it's God, He has given you authority, and He has given you power. I thought about going on that this week, and God led me this way. Because I think the church so much today doesn't realize the power that Jesus left behind. That He said greater things that you would do. And if you read in Acts, the church was alive and powerful. And we'll probably get into that. But I don't want you to forget the dynamics of the power that came upon them in day 50. So that's probably a good place where we'll get to that. And ladies, you'll be back for that. But so many times we, try to, we realize we're in the kingdom, but we still try to live under our power. You have the assets of King Jesus at your disposal at your disposal, sorry. God reigns inside of you. And you've been left on this earth to tell people and to perform mighty miracles. And sometimes we forget that. There, there are many that think that those days are even over, that that's not the case anymore. But I don't agree with that theology. I believe in total sanctification, that you will be made more and more like Christ as you submit more to the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will live powerfully through you. That's my thoughts, whether you agree with them or not. And I can give you scriptures to back it up. But see, here's the one thing. If you deny the power, then where are you going to be? Greater things you will do collectively and individually than Jesus did because you have the power of God living in you. Back to Genesis, what happened though? We rebelled, we sinned. There is a deceiver, and there's a time in human history coming when the deceiver is even taken out of the world. But so many times now, our excuse is we don't have time, and, and we have all these temptations, and we just don't have the power living inside of us to live a holy, sanctified, set-apart life for God. Yes, you do. 
They rebelled, they fell, but God immediately, he already knew, had a plan of restoration that involved Jesus Christ. The hope that we had, even back in Genesis, that Jesus Christ would come and rule and reign. In Genesis chapter 3, reading still from the New Living Translation, in verse 13, Then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. We like to pass the blame. We like to say that, that, we're, that we're just not good enough. We don't know the things to say. We make all these excuses rather than saying, I will be your servant. I do have the power. Teach me, O Lord. Empower me. You just gave the prayer request and praises of how many victories over cancer alone. And how many do you think God is directly responsible for? They're not just by chance. How many times in your life do you not realize how an angel was watching over you or whatever it was that you're here still today? I know you can look back and say, there's so many things that I've done in my life that should have cost me this or that. But God has a plan for you. And His plan is for you to give Him glory and honor and draw people into the kingdom. She replied, that's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the servant, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause, ho cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. The story that we still have. But Jesus was victorious when he laid down his life and when he arose from the grave. There is still that battle that we fight. Paul warns us that we are in a spiritual battle, not to rely on the, our eyes and our physical senses, but to realize we're in a spiritual battle and to put on God's armor and that we can extinguish every fiery dart or arrow that the devil throws at us. There will be hostility or enmity between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and he will strike his heel. So we also have a promise that Jesus Christ will come. And we know that Jesus Christ has come. And He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God's reign through God's children over God's creation. Is Jesus your King and is He reigning in your life? I don't know, I like reading these verses over these 40 days and thinking about that time that they spent with Jesus and I find myself longing back to, well, I wish I could do that, but we spend time with Jesus every single day that we spend time with Him. I was thinking about it when we took our prayer request that what a privilege we have to make our requests known to God. But any time we can read His Word, especially in this country, in whatever translation you want to, we can meditate it and ponder upon it but we do spend more time eating physical food, probably most of us, than we do digesting spiritual food, unfortunately. And it takes me to the temptation, and I mentioned that to you last week, that immediately the Spirit, after Jesus was made known, ushered Him or directed Him into the wilderness to be tempted. And the reason I'm going there is we have that temptation in the beginning that we fell to. We didn't pass the test. But Jesus passes the test. And we have the power of God living in us. We can say to Satan, flee from us just as Jesus did, and he will flee from us. I remember the, the reading the scripture where Jesus sends out the 70 or 72, depending on how you view that, and they came back praising that demons even submitted to them in the name of Jesus. And he said, don't rejoice over that. I mean, that's, that's powerful but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That no one can take that away from you. Repent, change the way you think so that you will change your heart, so that you'll focus on kingdom living because of what King Jesus has done for you. And do not deny the power that lives inside of you. If you're not living for the kingdom, then ask God to put that as a priority in your life. To not, well, it goes this way, right? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Let me be satisfied. Give me daily bread. Help me to forgive others. Lead us not into temptation. I know I'm skipping some. You know the rest. You can fill it in. 
Seek God's kingdom first, and all the things that you need, He will add to you. He will give you. Don't have fear over things you don't have or what if you don't do this. Seek God's kingdom first, and He will give you more than you could ever dream of. And I can't dream or fathom anything more than fishing for men and knowing that my grandchildren, when I hear that laughter, will follow me into the kingdom because they saw, said, I saw Papa's faith. I want to be a fisher of men. I want to seek God's kingdom first. Jesus passed the test. He has faced all the temptations that you or I faced, and He conquered in Matthew chapter 4, the NLT, it reads this way, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, Scriptures say this, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Read God's Word, study God's Word, consume it. Let it mature you, let it nourish you. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off, for the Scriptures say. He will order His angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus replied, The Scriptures also say that you must not test the Lord your God. And I told you last week that Satan twisted Scripture and was reading from Psalm 91. In a minute, I'm going to read you Psalm 91. Because we're going back in history again, and we're going to listen to that uh, second part of Isaiah video. And you might wonder, well, why is Alan doing this? Because during those 40 days, Jesus referred to Scripture from the Old Testament about God's redemptive plan, God's love, who He was, and who you and I are in that plan. And that He was going to prepare a place for us, and He was leaving us behind as His hands and feet in this world. And I just picture again Him going through Isaiah and me sitting there at His feet saying, Oh, wow, yeah, you're opening up these scriptures, and it's burning in my heart because of the love that you have for me. And I have a responsibility. Teach me, O Lord. Who am I going to send? Send me, Lord. Send me. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of this world and their glory. Because so many times I focus on those things instead. The devil said, I will give it all to you if you kneel down and worship me. See, we don't have that part of the conversation with Eve, do we? But that's where the conversation was headed. Satan wants your worship. He wants your devotion. He wants you to serve him as king. But you know what King Jesus did for you. You know the love that God has for you. Don't listen to him. Study God's word and tell the devil to flee from you. He has no power and no authority in your life. Verse 10, Jesus said, Get out of here, Satan. For the Scriptures say, You must worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Then the devil went away, and angels came and took care of Jesus. Now that Scripture that Satan quoted, like I said, he used Scripture that if you read that Scripture, you can't do anything but rejoice. Where Moses is writing this about the promised land and all the things that God took care of for the people in the wilderness. When you read those scriptures sometime and you don't have this perspective of Jesus, you think, wow, Merle was talking about some from Deuteronomy this morning. Wow, I can't believe that this is the same God of the Old Testament that's the God of the New Testament. Yes, it is. And he was, there was a stiff-necked people that continually rebelled when God was giving them not only da daily bread, but the promised land was right over the horizon if they would simply listen to God and worship Him only. Psalm 91, reading from the NLT again, reads this way. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust Him. 
For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from every deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. And I quoted you or at least told you some about Ephesians 6 where Paul says to put on God's armor because it will quench every fiery dart that the devil throws out at you. <laughs> Satan's quoting these words, and if only you would realize what he's quoting, the man, the hope that you have, and the trust that you have, and the praise that you have for God Almighty. Verse 5, Do not be afraid of the terrors of night, nor the arrows that fly in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. Can you imagine Jesus reading these words and, and their hearts burning? Oh, wow. Yeah, here I've been looking with my physical eyes when I should have been looking with spiritual eyes and see the protection that God has and the love that He has for me. That He would send His one and only Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, to die for me. Tell me more, Jesus. <laughs> Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. For He will order His angels to protect you wherever you go. Exactly what we see at the end of, of Jesus' temptation. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Hallelujah. Praise God. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And you know the way, the way to live for King Jesus. You know the truth. And you know that He offers you abundant life now in this life and forevermore. As Jesus came into Jerusalem as king, the crowds recognized him. They said, Hosanna, save us now. But they wouldn't pledge their allegiance to King Jesus because he was a humble servant that was laying down his life to save others. And that's exactly what Jesus teaches us to do, to follow and to serve him. In John chapter 12, verse 37, we read... But despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people still not, did not believe in Him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has, to whom has the Lord revealed His powerful arm? That's from Isaiah chapter 53. But the people couldn't believe, for Isaiah also wrote from Isaiah chapter 6, The Lord has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so that their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and have them heal them. Have your eyes been open to see? If they have, then listen to how Jesus is telling you to live for the kingdom. Verse 41, Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this, because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from their synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise of God. Do you have any excuses that is keeping you from pledging your allegiance to King Jesus? Are there any excuses that are keeping you from serving Him with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength? Do you truly believe and does your life show that Jesus is your King? Just as Isaiah prophesied about the coming captivity and destruction, as we're going to see in the video here in just a second, Jesus is our hope. He is the reason that we live, the reason that we know that we have eternal life and that nothing can separate us from God's love. The book of Isaiah is quoted over and over in the New Testament. And most of the times that Jesus quotes, and I'm getting ready for the video, Logan, He is teaching a rebellious people to repent and experience God's glory 
and live in his kingdom the way they were designed and created.